Hello everyone, uh, sorry not to be with you today, uh, or this week actually, um, whilst I'm away on some training, uh, but do not worry, I've got a great lesson lined up for you, uh, so let's get straight into it. So we're going to be looking at the use of computer technology in society, and this is one of those softer sort of topics within computing. Um, we're not looking at how to program something or how a computer works, we're looking at the impact of computing uh, in a sort of wide and more general way. And it's a sort of um, topic that exam boards do like to throw in there um, because they, they force, well not force, they, they test uh, the extent to which you really think about what you're learning about. So it's an opportunity for you to show that it's, you don't just know how to read facts and, and recall them in an exam, but you can actually really apply that knowledge and think more deeply about everything that you're learning in computing. So, uh, in terms of specifics for today's lesson, uh, here are our outcomes, our learning outcomes. So, um, we've got three lessons this week. Uh, most content is going to be in today's lesson, and then for the remaining two lessons, you're going to be making some infographics to uh, present some of the different things that we've been thinking about. So, uh, but over these three lessons, um, you should be able to evaluate the effectiveness of computer programs and solutions, i.e., technological solutions, and you should be able to evaluate the impact of and the issues related to the use of computer technology in society. So let's get started with the first of those, effectiveness of computing solutions. Well, we can look at the effectiveness of something in two different ways. Um, one is how well the solution has matched the design specification. So if you think back to your software development life cycle, right at the start in the requirements phase, you came up with some ideas or it, you know, a client has a need and the people making the software identify that need and they think about, well, what's the requirements of the solution? Um, and if you've completely missed the mark, then obviously your solution is not very effective, but if you've nailed it bang on and it does everything the client wants it to do, uh, then it is effective. Um, but a second way to look at effectiveness is here, you know, how it's used in and what the benefits are uh, for society. So it might be that uh, a solution meets the needs of a client, but if no one's using it or if it is when it's actually released into the wild, if it sort of has some sort of detrimental impact, then has it been an effective solution? Um, so that's sort of what we're going to look at today. Uh, so, we're going to look at three different areas. We're going to look at shopping, medicine, and social networking. Now, these are not exclusive. These are not the only areas you could be looking at. And indeed, the examples that we're going to look at are not the only examples uh, within this area. These examples are not on the specification particularly. That In fact, there are no specified um, examples that the exam board tells us we need to look at. But... Um, they are broad and the kind of pattern is the same. We're always going to be looking um, for some way of technology being involved in society and we'll look at the advantages, the disadvantages and try to come up with some kind of opinion as to whether we think it's worthwhile in the end. Um, so, for an exam, don't necessarily worry about revising these exact examples but instead use these lessons as the opportunity to grow and develop the skills that you would need to evaluate any example that you might be presented with in an exam. So let's start with the impact of computing technology on shopping. So shopping has changed massively in, in the last decade or so and really that's been driven by broadband and mobile internet access. Um, lots of people in the UK have access to the internet either through um, cable or phone lines um, or through their mobile phones and that has meant that the market has increased massively for online shopping um, and also the speed and reliability of those connections is significantly greater than it used to be which also enables uh, more shopping and people feel more confident about doing it online. Um, in fact from January to March in 2012 um, 8.2% of British online shopping was done on a mobile which is an increase of 2000% from that same period in 2010. However, it's worth pointing out that that period in 2010 is probably when the iPad was launched first. So you can see since the launch of the iPad, two years later, there's a 2000% increase in um, online shopping being done on a mobile. 
The way we're sold to has also changed. It's not just how we buy, it's where we're sold to, where we're, the marketing, the advertising. Uh, we are contacted through emails, through in-page advertising. I'm sure you've all seen, in fact, most of you probably have ad blockers to get rid of that. Um, you're sold to in adverts through apps, through search, um, through social networks as well. So now it's not only that we as consumers can buy things in a different way, but retailers can uh, target us differently. And actually that targeting is normally um, pretty good. They, they actually do a fairly good job of identifying the sort of things you're into and showing you relevant adverts. Whereas sort of old day advertising, just putting things on the side of a bus or in a newspaper, you sort of had to take a punt that the people who see it would be interested in that product. Um, so for niche products, it was a lot more difficult to get out there. Uh, whereas now it's actually quite easy because these digital marketeers, they know so much more about us. So we can shop online 24 hours a day from a global marketplace. And in fact, the most popular browsing and shopping times in the UK are now sort of in the evening, um, which is when most traditional shops have shut. So actually more shopping is being done when the shops are shut. That's kind of the state of play. Um, and technology companies are taking the role of the middleman. Um, you know, if you think about it, Apple gets 30% of all app sales and sales via the apps, the in-app purchases. So if you sign up to Spotify within the Spotify app, to Spotify Premium, 30% of that goes to Apple. So um, technology companies are sort of taking over the traditional positions of many retailers. Um, is this a win-win? I mean, online shopping, you can pretty much buy anything in the world from anyone. Uh, prices tend to be lower due to increased competition. Um, anyone can sell a product on the global market. If you think about sites like Etsy, um, you can uh, find loads of home crafted products there that people can buy. Uh, Kickstarter, you can get um, going with uh, projects. You know, you don't need to find a, a major investor. You can crowdsource that investment. Um, so surely this is good news for consumers and producers and retailers. Well, this is what we need to evaluate. Is it as clear and cu uh, as clear cut as it looks at first, or is there more complexity to this? So let's watch a video, see what they have to say, and then there's a little activity for you to get going with on Google Classroom. The new year could bring uncertainty to the nation's retailers. <laughs> Holiday sales at brick and mortar stores grew, but less than expected last year with only a 3% jump online sales. Beat expectations with a 9% boost. But customers are expected to send back 30% of clothing and the shoes that they bought online, and that's twice the rate of returns in traditional stores. Shannon Pettypiece. I like that name. <laughs> Shannon Pettypiece? She's a reporter with Bloomberg News. She likes News. it, too. Yeah. Do you like it, too? I'll bet you didn't get teased as a little girl. Uh, well, you know, I had the option to change it, and I kept it. Oh, so, yeah. good for you. Okay, so more people buy online, yeah. they return online. I definitely plead guilty. I'll buy yeah. two sizes. Sometimes three. Oh, two and sizes is good. Yeah, we're talking about people buying nine so, pairs of shoes online and then returning yes. eight of them. Yeah. And that's not good. Oh, the point is to make sure you have something that fits you. Yeah, so you want to make sure. Right. Does, yeah. and, but the retailers. <laughs> Always dreaming, Charlie, to get in the smaller size. Yeah. And the retailers hate this, though. I mean, hate some it. companies like Zappos, yes, they know you're going to do that. They have that built into your business model. But online, people buying more online means they're returning more online. And returns kill the retailers. Here's just an example. If you buy a $100 sweater yeah. and then return that, after all of the repackaging, shipping fees, and then the markdown they have to put on that sweater because now it's February and no one's buying sweaters, they could only make $20 on that sweater they originally sold you for $100. So this oh. rise in online, this rise in returns is really hurting retailers right now. So is there a risk that it could be passed down to us, the shoppers, in the future? In other well, luckily, it's sort of a buyer's market out there right now. Um, there's a lot of competition in retail. There's a lot of pressure on price. So yeah, retailers can try and inch their prices up, but they've got Amazon knocking at their door, who's mm -hmm. not as worried about price as some of these big retailers are, like Macy's or Target. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're stuck in a hard place. So a lot of them, we're seeing their margins shrink, and a lot of them, we're seeing operating at a loss. What's the best way to determine if you're getting a good price? Well, you could shop online, and pretty much everyone <laughs> online is price matching these okay, days, so too. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. price matching. Yeah. Oh, I mean, online, everyone is really competitively price matching. You'll see prices changing throughout the day. One lows, lowers, the other lowers. A lot of the retailers are getting very savvy about price matching. Is there matching. one site that does that? Well, Amazon's really leading it, but mm -hmm. all the websites, Target, Walmart. Right. I mean, I was watching over the holiday season. 
you'd see one drop their prices, all the, other, the other one, one fall away. But they right make away. it easy for us to return, though, Shannon, with the free shipping. That's number yes. one. And number two, where do the returns go? Well, I mean, you think sometimes you send it back, it's going to the Gap, and they're going to put it back on the shelf. Yes. A lot of times it never even goes back to the retailer. It goes to a liquidator, a wholesaler, who then resells it on this sort of second market. So consignment shops, mm. eBay, sometimes overseas. So sometimes it's not even going back to that retailer. They'll get a little cut from a liquidator who then is reselling so it somewhere So what's your message else. here? Don't return? <laughs> no, well, seriously, I what think, do you want us to do? I think the retailers need to figure out a better way to sell online. Oh, okay. They need to do right. virtual right. shopping. Uh, you see Got companies it. like Zappos doing videos, uh, 3D modeling where you enter your measurements and they can show you how something looks. So the world is going online and the re it's not up to the consumer to do a better job. It's up to the retailer to do a better job making sure that fits you and that's the color you, you signed up for when you All bought right. it. All right. Thank not you, Shannon. Up measurements. Thank you. Great no, to have you here. Thank you. Okay, so having watched that video, go to Google Classroom and open up the impact of computer technology on society assignment. Uh, when you open the assignment, you should see uh, the um, Google form that I've put in there, which has questions about online shopping for you to answer. When you've done that, come back here and we will start looking at the impact of computing technology on medicine. Great, so hopefully you've uh, done the form now and um, don't worry about submitting it till we get to the end of all the sections. Um, so let's look at medical advances through computing. So this is probably uh, one of the areas with the greatest impact on society. Um, there have been enormous advances in medicine which have all come as a result of technological development. You can think of um, MRI scans, ultrasounds, um, Oh, or anything like that, um, heart rate monitors, there's just so many areas that technology has really impacted uh, upon people's health uh, and on the medical profession. And also, of course, there are things like self-service diagnosis things online too. So, yeah, some of the biggest advances in society um, have come from the medical field. Monitoring solutions... Uh, allow us to uh, have more effective diagnosis uh, and some proactive care. If you think um, it's quite common now to be wearing a device that might measure your heart rate um, and there are things for uh, diabetics to be um, able to quickly uh, test their glucose levels. Um, you know, there are all of these different um, devices that allow us to take a proactive approach to care and not worry about um, we don't wait until we're ill to then get help. We can keep ourselves healthy uh, by having this constant real-time feedback. Um, so, yeah, things like Fitbits, Garmin's, Apple Watches and so on are, are changing this landscape, um, not just for those who have been uh, diagnosed with an illness, but generally otherwise healthy people who also are more interested in their health. Um, but the, probably the most profound area of medicine um, that has had an impact from technology is um, in the field of medical implants. So this started off really uh, the first examples of which were pacemakers. So little devices with a microchip inside that um, gives you uh, a regular heartbeat. Um, cochlear impa implants, these are used to help you hear. Uh, and there are retinal implants which when you have a damage to your retina um, can actually sort of bypass that and provide sight. So some incredible advances, uh, and we're going to look now at uh, a cochlear implant and how that works. So, um, traditional hearing aids, they sit outside the body, and they have a microphone and a little amplifier unit, and they amplify the sound that's going into the ear. So basically, they're a bit like a, a digital ear trumpet. Um, they just make things louder. Um, which is great if you can't hear well, but if you can't hear at all because you've got damaged nerves in your inner ear, then it doesn't really matter how loud the sound, sound going in is, um, it's not going to make the connections internally, so no sound is going to be sent to your brain through your, um, your auditory nerves. A cochlear implant overcomes this by connecting um, directly to the nerves in your inner ear, and what it does is it receives audio signals and it sends them straight to the brain. So it's not actually using any of the sort of mechanical internal of your, your ear at all. It's bypassing it. And it's, um, yeah, it's got this, as I say, this direct connection by sending the electrical signal straight through the nerves into your brain. It's really quite mind-blowing. Um, so we're going to watch another video now uh, showing how they work. And then 
I would like you to go on and do the second part of the Google form. In case of sound waves striking the ear, they pass through the canal to the eardrum. From there, the sound waves are mechanically transmitted to the inner ear and amplified. In the inner ear, you can find the cochlea. The cochlea consists of three different canals. The middle canal is the organ of hearing and consists of sensitive hair cells. The hair cells can be stimulated electrically and forward the signal to the nerves and then onto the brain. In most cases of deafness, the hearing nerve still remains functional but the hair cells have been damaged or even lost. In a cochlear implant system, sound enters a microphone and travels to an external mini-computer called a sound processor. The sound is processed and converted into digital information. This digital information is sent over a transmitter antenna to the surgically implanted part of the system. The implant will turn the sound information into electrical signals that travel down to an electrode array inserted into the tiny inner ear or cochlea. The electrodes directly stimulate the auditory nerve, sending sound information to the brain. Bypassing the damaged inner ear, the cochlear implant provides an entirely new mechanism for hearing. Great, okay, uh, last of the three sections I wanted to look at then are the changes in social networking through computing. So this is, has obvious uh, relationship with technology. Um, in fact, we, we can't really now imagine the word social network without thinking of an online service like Facebook or Twitter. Uh, but of course, believe it or not, we've had social networks long before then. The communities that we live in, that we work in, that we play in, these are our social networks, our friends, our family. Um, but as I say, the term has taken on a whole new meaning, so profound is the impact that these services have had on our society. Now, there are lots of positive impacts uh, of social networks on society. You can think of things like online education. Uh, what you're doing right now, in, in fact, um, being able to be taught even when your teacher can't be with you, um, or joining in on these massive online courses um, that edX and people like that do. Um, there are other examples, obviously. Um, Code Academy is one. You know, people can learn new skills online. They can connect up with educators um, and they can you know, get qualifications, get better jobs, and so on. Um, political engagement. Uh, it's now so much easier to be involved. You can uh, follow what your MP does, see what they've done every day, hold them to account. You can sign petitions that, if enough people sign, uh, will result in a debate in the Houses of Parliament. Um, you can have debates and hold debates online. Um, obviously, uh, companies can do different levels of marketing and consumer research. You can get involved more easily now in things like beta testing products uh, and giving feedback on services. As I said earlier, there are crowdfunded projects, Kickstarter, things like that. Um, giving as well, justgiving.com, being able to raise far more money than you would have easily been able to do before. Uh, and transparency in government. This means being able to see what a government's up to, uh, them releasing huge data sets to us so that we can find out um, about crime or about education, about employment in different areas and so on. So, so we, this allows us to do research, this allows us to understand the world we live in more. So lots and lots and lots of things uh, going on that are positive impacts through social networks. There are some downsides, and uh, one of the key ones is this thing called the digital divide. Uh, and basically, the premise is this. Not everyone has access to a great internet connection. Um, they might live far away. They might live in the, in the countryside, or they might live somewhere rural like the Shetland Islands. Um, it might be that they can't afford it. Um, it might be that they don't have the skill to use a computer or the internet confidently. And you can imagine that people of a certain age might um, fall into that category. 
So relying on the internet to um, engage with important services like the NHS, like doing online banking, like paying for your car tax, applying for a passport, all these core services, um, if, if you don't have access to that, then you have a huge risk that swathes of society could get left behind. Um, in a very small way, what happens in your family if all of a sudden you don't meet up as often uh, as family, don't get together maybe in the school holidays and at Christmas because everyone's kind of in touch with each other over social media, but you've got maybe grandma and grandpa somewhere in the family who are not connected digitally and they miss out and there's social isolation and so on. So, you know, they're forgotten, they're left in a, a care home somewhere while everyone else is, is sort of chatting away on Facebook on Christmas Day. You know, actually, it sounds silly, but there's a huge uh, potential risk here that we sort of divide society uh, between the haves and the have-nots of technology. Another risk, major one, is the loss of privacy, something you should be taking really, really carefully as you continue to use uh, you know, the internet every single day. Companies such as Google collect information about every site you visit. If you're using Google Chrome, and it's a great browser, but there's one really good reason that Google can give it to you for free, and that is that it's, it, it, they can collect, they know every single site you're looking at. They collect huge usage statistics about you, and they can sell that for profit, and that's what funds everything. Um, insurance companies could use data about you, uh, so if we start giving away more information about where we go on holiday, what activities we're into, a life insurance company that knows that you go base jumping and skiing is likely to charge more than someone that, that doesn't. Or maybe they're not, because of course if you sit around and just watch TV all day, um, maybe that's more unhealthy. But the point being that the more information you share, potentially companies could then start penalising you for that. Uh, fraud is a massive risk. Um, it's not difficult to go on someone's Facebook and find out who their parents are, uh, who their best friend is, where they've lived, and you could probably use that information to um, be able to spoof your way through um, a security check, uh, maybe with an online bank or something like that. So risks uh, of social networks include you know, fraud, uh, people profiteering off you, and um, your data being used against you somehow. So I've got another video for you. Watch this and then go on to complete the last part of the Google form. When you've done that, uh, you can start working on the prep, which I will explain after this video. We live in a world where technology is fast pacing and access to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and many other social platforms is all around us. With 95% of teens using the internet and 81% of them using social media, it is important to understand the possibilities that arise when using such websites. My name is Sophie and I'm going to talk to you about social media, the good and the bad. So let's start with time. Whilst juggling school, sleep and many other activities, on average it's been found that we teenagers manage to fit in 5 hours a day on social networks. In this time, you could have flown to Cyprus or boiled 50 eggs. So it looks like we're spending a fair amount of time online. Let's take a look at some of the cons. One of the biggest social networking problems is cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is just like normal bullying, except it requires the use of electronic communication. Electronic communication can be anything from a laptop to a tablet, devices that are all around us. It's been found that half of students have reported being cyberbullied. This is scary as it can result in both emotional as well as psychological consequences, ranging from schooling problems to deviant behaviour. Unfortunately, social media is still being used as a platform for sexual abuse. We often hear of terms such as sexting on the news, where explicit messages or photos are sent online. In the past years, there has been a 28% of increase in calls to Childline. It's important to remember that as a young person, sexting is illegal and can end up in some serious consequences. Teenagers who are sexually abused are three times as likely to become depressed or suicidal. Another issue with social networking is fake profiles. With 83.09 million fake accounts on Facebook alone, that's more accounts than people that live in the UK. This is mind-blowing. The main problem is you may have no idea who you was talking to. Another risk is advertising. Social platforms such as Facebook use algorithms. 
These look at private information such as your date of birth, where you live and even personal traits. By doing this, advertisers can choose advertisements which are most suited to you. This can be dangerous as your information is no longer confidential. Now let's explore some of the positives. Socialising. Isn't that what social networks were made for? With 52% of teens stating that social media has helped their relationships with other people, social networks can not only facilitate the creation of new friendships, but also allow you to develop and maintain existing friendships. This is a key skill in your social life. Social networks can even be used as educational tools. Whether you want to discuss homework or research an unfamiliar topic, social networks allow you to do this. It can also provide a platform for schools to create online resources such as blogs to answer any questions and interact with students such as yourself on an educational level. Many teenagers share content on websites such as YouTube or on a personal blog. This content can range from creating art to story sharing. Furthermore, we teenagers can also comment on this content that others are uploading. This is a form of self-expression and allows you to be creative and connect with others online with the same interests. By sharing content, it allows us to increase our collective self-esteem and communicate with individuals from all around the world. Closely linked to collective self-esteem, research has shown that social media can increase our individual self-esteem. This is common with teenagers who would normally find face-to-face -face situations daunting and uncomfortable. This is great as it means that social networks can increase social capital for many teenagers who feel unable to make friends. So let's sum up. Today we have looked at the negatives. Cyberbullying, sexual abuse, fake accounts and advertising. And on the other hand, socialising, improving education, sharing content and finally increasing self-esteem. So today I've spoken about a few of the pros and cons involved with social networking. By looking at both the positive and negative aspects, you can be aware of any dangers while also enjoying the benefits. Furthermore, you can now share this knowledge with others. My name is Sophie and I hope you found this useful. Okay, so for prep, I would like you to uh, finish the Google form if you've not already, uh, and then there's a worksheet as well uh, within the class assignment, which um, basically asks you to pick either medical advances or social networking. There are two videos linked there. They are not the videos you've seen already. They are different videos. I want you to watch um, whichever video. So if you're doing social networking, watch that video, or if you're watching, you know, the medical one, watch the medical video. So watch the video and then write an answer to the discussion question. Now this discussion question is sort of worth eight marks. It's a bit like an exam question. You should aim therefore for about one page of A4 in length. You should discuss the advantages and the disadvantages of the, the content, whether it's the medical or the social uh, stuff. Um, use what you've seen in the video to help kind of broaden your mind. Think differently perhaps about... Um, what it is we're looking at. Um, and then I want you to give a firm conclusion at the end. So I don't just want disadvantages and advantages, I want a conclusion as well, and, and a justified conclusion. Um, in terms of advantages and disadvantages, when you're planning your answer, by all means, use bullet points on another piece of paper and get some ideas down. But for this piece of work, I want written sentences and paragraphs. It should be like a one-page essay on the topic. Okay, this I want you to do tonight. Uh, it's due in tomorrow. Your cover teacher tomorrow will collect it. Well, actually, no. Haha, -ha, you'll submit it through Google Classroom, so I will know if you've got it in on time. Excellent. That's brilliant. Um, and uh, tomorrow we can start looking at, um, yeah, this, um, what is it, uh, the infographic assignment. So thank you for paying attention throughout this lesson. Sorry again that I've not been with you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it anyway, and um, I will see you or speak to you at least tomorrow.